Good morning, church. Good morning, morning. As always, it's a great privilege to be able to share God's Word with all of you. Uh, would you join me in prayer, even as we commit this time to the Lord? Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you for your strong presence that is in this place. Thank you for the wonderful time where we can all praise you and worship you. Lord, even right now as we hear your word, Lord, your word is living and active, sharper than a two-aged sword. Father, I pray, I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be at attentive to you. Holy Spirit, would you move among our midst and speak to us, God, even as we listen to your word. Father, I ask for your anointing, I ask for your help. Even as I share this word that you have placed in my heart, pray for clarity, Lord, to be able to explain and preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen, Amen. Now we will be continuing our series on the book of uh, 1 John. Right, but first, a little recap from last week's sermon. Now last week, uh, Pastor Mark To kick-started this series. It was supposed to be Pastor Daniel Tew, but he was unwell. But it's so good to see him today. He's back and he's well again. Now, as mentioned by Pastor Mark Toh, this book is a rather short book, right? Just five chapters. So I would really encourage us, you know, to take your time, take time to read and study this short but amazing epistle. Now, do you remember what Pastor Mark preached last week? Now, let's do a recap, okay? He talked about what does it mean to walk in the light, right? Based out on the key text in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And he shared with us three pointers, right? Mainly, walking in true fellowship. What does it look like? Walking in the light. What does it mean to walk in the light? And thirdly, walking in grace. What happens when we sin? And in his sermon, he said that walking in the light, it does not mean that one does not sin, but that he or she actually struggles with sin. And I record in, the, in his sermon, he said, if you struggle with sin, congratulations, because you are struggling, compared to those who have stopped struggling and have succumbed completely to the world. And if you sin, he assured us that we can run to our Father, right, in repentance, and He will forgive us, that we must not allow our guilt to drive us away from God, but instead to draw us closer to Him, right? Now, in the first part of 1 John chapter 2, particularly from verses 1 to 14, it continues with this idea of the assurance of faith that we have in Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, in Jesus Christ, now, right from the start, right from the beginning of chapter 2, the Apostle John, he continues to write about our Saviour, Jesus Christ. In verses 1 and 2, he, re he reads, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, to propitiate, I guess, is another word is atonement. Basically, it means to satisfy the wrath, the wrath of God against sin. And John, it continues to redirect our attention to Jesus Christ, even from verses 3 to 14. And he continues to give us this assurance that all of us have in Christ, that our sins are forgiven for His name's sake, right, in verse 12. And in verse 13, it says that because of Christ, we have overcome the evil one. And verse 14, because of Christ, we now know the Father, that His Word abides in us. And for our brief time this morning, we are going to be looking at verses 15 to 17. Now, you will find here in many ways, in my personal opinion, it's quite an interesting text, but it's very critical and very important to all of us. I've entitled my message today, When Love is Sinful. When Love is Sinful. And I pray that by the end of our sermon, we will all have, uh, have a firm understanding of what exactly, what exactly is the kind of love that is sinful. 
Now, would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. All right, let us read God's Word together. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version that is shown on the screen. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Ready, go. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, you know, when I read these verses, I was initially a little bit surprised and I would say a little bit confused because this verse is a little bit, a little bit out of place. And, and to me, it's a little bit contradictory to what we Christians stand for. Right? We Christians are lovers, right? We are called to love. We love because God first loved us. You know the famous verse in Matthew 22, uh, verses 37 to 39, where it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. You know, there are countless commands in the Bible that tells us to love. In fact, the Apostle John talks so much about loving God and loving one another. In John chapter 13, verse 35, he says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. What is this, this? This, this is if you have love for one another. Right? The world will know that we are Christians by our love and our love for one another. And to take it up a notch, not only for our love for one another, but he also tells us to love our enemies. Right? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 44, right? you have heard that you have said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All throughout the Bible, love permeates. Even the Apostle Paul, he said this statement in Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. I think it was referred to last week as well in the sermon. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment, they are all summed up in these words. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. By love, we fulfill the law. So it's undeniable that we as Christians, we are to embody love. We are to aspire to be more and more like Christ, to love one another, even towards those who are against us. But right here in chapter 2, verse 15, we have this issue of the world, right? And John tells us, hey, do not love the world. He gives us this warning, this command, do not, do not love the world. Now, wait a minute. There is another verse that I think all of us here, we should know. Because if we have gone through Sunday school, all right, many of us probably have gone through Sunday school, you have learned this verse in Sunday school. Remember John 3.16? John 3.16, the famous verse that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, right, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish and have eternal life. So what is going on here? To love or not to love? And in the light of the scriptures that I've shown to us, our main text can be a little bit confusing. Therefore, it is crucial for us to understand what exactly does John mean when he said the world? What is this world? It's imperative for us to note that the word world, especially in texts written by the Apostle John, it is used in at least three different ways. Right? The Greek word for world is cosmos, from which we get the words such as cosmic, cosmopolitan, right? just to state two of them, two of these words. 
You know, firstly, the first meaning of the word world, it can refer to all creation. We can see this usage of the word world, cosmos, in many parts of John's scripture. Like in John 1, verses 9 to 10, the famous verse in John 3, 16. In John 4, 42, right, where the people finally believe that Jesus is the saviour of the world. John 6, 14, where Jesus fed the 5,000 and the people said that he is the prophet who is to come into the world. So I've cited a few scriptures where world, cosmos, it refers to all creation, all the created universe. Now John is not saying to us in verse 15 that we should not love the created universe. We should not love that which God has created. No. Now the second way of, in which the word cosmos is used it refers to the people that inhabits the earth, you and I. And clearly, John is not telling us to not love people, right? To not love mankind. This will contradict what Matthew 22 just said, that I just said in, uh, in, 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 in the scripture, right? That you will love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not referring to that. However, there is a third way. There's a third way in which the word cosmos is used. It means the spiritual realm that is in opposition to God, that is in rebellion against His kingdom. It is this meaning of the word cosmos that John is referring to here in verse 15. Hence, when John gave us this stern warning to not love the world, he's telling us to not love that which is anti-God, that which is governed by the evil one. And if you read on further in chapters 3 to 5, you will realize that John makes a very firm case about this evil world that we are living in. He writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, that this world is ignorant of God. In chapter 3, verse 13, he says that the world hates us believers. Right? In chapter 4, verse 1, he says the world is the home of many false prophets. In chapter 4, verse 3, the world is the home of the Antichrist and ultimately is controlled by the evil one. And in chapter 5, verses 4 to 5, he says that by faith, we, you and I as Christians, we are able to overcome the world. So now we know that it is this third definition that John tells us to not love. It is this worldly love that God forbids. And to put it in another way, this kind of love is sinful. And for the remaining time that we have, I wish to highlight to us through verses 15 to 17, three ways. Three ways where love, when love is sinful. Firstly, love is sinful when it is pointed in the wrong direction. Let's take a look at verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I love the way John Calvin puts it in his commentary of 1 John. He said, The only rule for living religiously is for us to love God. But when we are occupied with the vain love of the world, we turn away all our thoughts and affections another way. This vanity must first be torn away from us in order that the love of God may reign within us. Until our minds are cleansed, the former doctrine may be iterated to us a hundred times, but with no effect. It will be like pouring water on a ball. You can gather not even one drop because there is no empty place to retain water. When I read this, you know, the analogy really spoke to me. Can you imagine you just pour water over a ball? The, wa the water will just flow down the ball, right? You can't catch anything unless you put a ball below, lah, right? Now, when we become occupied with the things of this world, there is no more room in our hearts for the things of God. Listen to what James said in James chapter 4, verse 4. He said something quite similar. Do you not know that friendship within the, with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself 
an enemy of God. What about Matthew 6, 24? No one can serve two masters, right? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. This is an either-or situation, right? We cannot love this worldly system, if you will, and God simultaneously. In fact, when you and I made the decision to accept Christ as our Lord and Saviour, we have been taken out of this worldly system. Last week, a significant event happened. Do you guys remember in our church? 13 of our brothers and sisters were baptised, right? Three of our youths were baptised at the youth service. You know, every time when I conduct a, or I witness a baptism service, I'm, I'm reminded of this verse in 1 Peter 2.9. It says that God has caught you out of darkness into His marvellous light. It means that there is this transference of kingdom, right? From the kingdom of this world to God's kingdom, to God's domain. So our direction should be pointed towards God and not towards the worldly system. But if our love is still directed towards this worldly system and our allegiance is not fully unto God, then what the Apostle John said in 1 John 2 verse 19 will actually be quite scary, quite scarily true. He said this, The people, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. They chose not to remain in God, not to abide in Him. For their love and affection were directed at the system that is in opposition to God. Now, as I was preparing this sermon in the past few weeks, I'm reminded of those whom I personally know who have chosen to direct their affections of the world to the world and not to God. Now, do you know of people in your life, your loved ones, your friends, your relatives, who have chosen, who have chosen not to remain in God? And I felt, even in the midst of this sermon right now, if the Holy Spirit reminds you of this person, if you know who they are, would you join me? Let us pray. Right, let's pray right now for them. Come, let's pray. Lord, we want to remember. We want to remember our loved ones, whoever they are, our friends, our relatives, or those that have succumbed to the things in the world, even those people that we know in church who have made the decision to, to not come to church. Lord, we remember them right now, even as we listen to your word. Holy Spirit, go ahead of us and minister to them. Lord, only you can change the hearts of people. Only you can turn them around and they will run back to you. So Lord, have your way. We lift them up to you. We remember them right now and we lift them up to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, Jesus himself, Jesus himself recorded Oh, no, John himself, sorry. John himself recorded Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verses 16 to 18. He said this, they are, Jesus said this, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them, us, into the world. May we be reminded today that you and I are sent into this world to share His good news through the way we live, through the way we conduct ourselves, through the way we treat others. But at the same time, we are not of this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And most assuredly, we are not to love this world. The second part of verse 15, and I paraphrase it, it says, do not love the things in the world. Now, I would like to suggest to us, just because externally, externally one may show that he or she does not love the things in the world, it does not mean that we do not crave for these things internally. What do I mean? 
Well, one, one can love alcohol, but do not drink it, right? One can don't watch pornography, but it does not mean that he or she don't have sexual fantasies. One can appear to celebrate the success of others, but internally he or she can covet what others have and be jealous over what they have. And over time, when we see others who genuinely struggle, that legalistic self within us may say, you know, I'm better than you. You know, I don't participate in these worldly things like you. I'm better than you. But the truth is, God knows that deep down inside of us that we still love it with every fibre of our being. That's why I think John did not say, do not participate in the world. Do not participate in the things of the world. He says, do not love the world and the things of the world. Be watchful to not think that we are morally or spiritually on a higher ground than others. Amen? Now, secondly, the second point is love is sinful. Love is sinful when it originates from the wrong source. Verse 16 says, For, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. In NASB and NIV versions of the Bible, it says the last of the flesh and the last of the eyes. We have the issue of misdirection in the first point. And now there is a problem with the source. From verse 16, we can tell that the love for the worldly system, it arises from the world, right? The world itself. Similarly, our love for God and for the things of God arises from God. It is He who gave us the ability and the capacity to love Him. But right here in verse 16, John is telling us that there is a love that is arising from a different source, from the world. And in this case, it is wrong. It is a wrong source. And the first two cravings, which are the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, or the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, these are sinful desires. The pride of life, and in some versions of, our, of uh, the different translations of the Bible, it says boasting. Right? This, however, is a sinful behavior, one that, is, one that is an external manifestation of something that goes on internally in our hearts. The last of the flesh and the last of the eyes, they are hidden sins. Right? If I look at you, I wouldn't know that you have the last of the flesh and the last of the eyes. They are hidden and it pertains to the individual person. But boasting, boasting is a revealed behavior, right? It pertains to a person that is living in community with people. Why do I say that? Because you cannot boast to yourself, right? Something is very wrong. If you look into the mirror every day, you say, oh, I'm very good, I'm better, I'm very good. Something is very wrong with you, right? You can't boast to yourself. You can only boast to somebody else if there's people around. The word last, when it's translated from the Greek, it means to have a strong craving. It's this uh, insatiable desire to want to obtain something. This internal hidden sin is what motivates many of us to want to go in a particular direction, a wrong direction. And what does John mean by the word flesh? I'd like to suggest to us that flesh is this desire to satisfy ourselves at the expense of God. Our flesh is this physical nature that we receive, right, when we are born, right, our flesh. But our spiritual nature is the nature that we receive when we are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we have confessed our sins and we turn from our sins and we receive Christ as our Saviour. Now, what about the last of the eyes? Now, what does John mean? John is referring to the sin of covetousness. What does this word mean? It means to desire to possess something that belongs to another person or even something that you already have enough of, to want to possess something that we see. In his commentary of 1 John, St. Augustine, he, he basically says that the last of the eyes... <clears throat> 
It stems out of this. It stems out of curiosity. What is curiosity? Augustine says, Curiosity is that which works in spectacles, in theatres, in the devil's sacraments, in magic, in evil deeds. That is where curiosity is. Basically, to sum it up, he is trying to say that curiosity is that which tantalizes our eyes, that which causes a spark in our eyes. You know, when we see something, woo, you know, it, it, it goes into our hearts and we start to fantasize over it. <clears throat> and such cravings, right, such cravings to satisfy our fleshy desires have existed way back in the Old Testament. In Genesis 3 verse 6, right, Eve actually wanted the fruit because the Bible says that it was pleasing to her eyes. In Joshua chapter 7, verses 20 to 21, Achan saw and coveted this beautiful robe from Babylonia. Right? And he took all the silver and gold as well. And I think all of us know 2 Samuel chapter 11, right? David and Bathsheba. David saw Bathsheba, a married woman, bathing under the glow of a Jerusalem night. Right? He was standing on the roof, right? And he became obsessed with Bathsheba. And he eventually slept with her, killed her husband, the last of the eyes. And finally, we have the pride of life. Right? The word pride, it carries in it this sense of exaggeration, right? this sense of boasting in order to impress people. Right? As I have mentioned, Boasting is an outward behavior. So how does being prideful, how does being boastful look like? Well, here are some personal examples of me being prideful. I thought I can share with us this morning. Love can lead me to share my testimony with all of us in a manner that honors God. But pride, pride can cause me to exaggerate my testimony to make myself the centre of attraction. No love can cause me to use my voice as an instrument of musical praise and worship unto God. But pride can make me love the sound of my own voice. <clears throat> love allows me to show gratitude to God for all the material things that He has blessed me with. And He has blessed me with a lot. But pride can make me constantly attach a price tag to these things so that others will be impressed and even be envious of me. You know, the New Testament scholar Simon Kistermaker, he has this to say about the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. He sums them all up in just one word. He says, the word is worldliness. And he says this, worldliness is lust and pride. We could summarize a worldly attitude by describing it as the craving and boasting so common among those who do not love God. Worldliness is marked by lust, desire, or craving. So love, can, love is sinful when it is misdirected. It is sinful when it originates from the wrong source. And lastly, love is sinful when it leads you and I to the wrong destination. Verse 17 says, The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. In some versions of the Bible, it says, abides forever. So there are two opposite ends of the spectrum in this verse. On one end, you have the world and its desires that will eventually pass away. But on the other hand, we have God. And for those who choose God, they will live forever. Our passions, our passions become sinful when they are pointed in directions that will lead to death and destruction instead of life. It is what that is going inside, what that is going on inside here that really matters. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. What is this will of God? I would like to suggest to us that the ultimate will of God is that each and every person will realize that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Right? They will in turn turn from their sins and turn to the Savior. 
It is the will of God that none shall perish and all will enter into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is the will of God that we know Him, that we will love Him and experience that love. And in turn, we will experience a love for each other. Right? We recall last week's sermon where we talk about true fellowship. Right? What is true fellowship? Where we will love each other. So ultimately, we as the church, not this building, but you and I, physical ones, you and I, we make up the church. We as disciples of Christ, we are to hold fast to our faith, which actually in practical terms, abide practically means to hold fast to your faith. Right? It's to choose to love God and one another and not the worldly system that we are living in. I don't know how many of you, you know of this very famous British Anglican priest and theologian. His name is John Stott. I think he has passed away already. You know, many years ago, he visited America and he was preaching in a church. And in that church, he said these words, and I'll read it to us. He said, you know what your country is like. I'm just a visitor, so I wouldn't presume to speak about America. But I know what Great Britain is like. I know something about the growing dishonesty, corruption, immorality, violence, pornography, the diminishing respect for human life, and the increase in abortion. Whose fault is it? Let me put it this way. If the house is dark at night, well, there is no sense in blaming the house. That's what happens when the sun goes down. The question that we should ask is, where is the light? If meat goes bad, there is no sense in blaming the meat. This is what happens when bacteria is allowed to breed unchecked. The question to ask is, where is the salt? If society becomes corrupt, like a dark night or stinking fish, there's no sense in blaming society. That's what happens when fallen human society is left to itself and human evil is unrestrained and unchecked. The question to ask is where is the church? Now, will we, the church, will we be the ones that will seek to hold fast to our faith, to not waver even when we are bombarded daily by the worldly system that we are living in. So what kind of love, God forbids, what kind of love is sinful? It is the kind that misdirects us. It is the kind that originates from the wrong source and ultimately leads us to the wrong direction. You know, Jesus himself said these words in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Who, for what? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Right? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? In the course of this preparation of this, this sermon, I have crafted a few reflection questions. I'll ask them to uh, the media team to show on the screen and leave it on for a while. No, I do not ask all of us this question only. I ask them myself. I have asked them myself. And honestly, all of my answers are yes. I have fallen with the world. I have fallen with the worldly system. I have placed my self-worth and my identity in my career before I came on as a pastor. And even now as a pastor, there are times when I'm envious of what others have the giftings of others that I do not have. I have. I do. I struggle with it. But if I can be courageous a bit, you know, if I can be bold, I think, I think I will say this. Every one of us in this auditorium, we probably will have fallen in love with the world in any shape or form in the course of our lives. I stand corrected but I'll just say it. But there is hope. I'm here today to tell us that there is hope. 
Because we need not, and must I, should I say, we must not feel condemned or guilty. Because I'm going to bring us back to the first two verses of 1 John chapter 2, where it says, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of your sins, of my sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. We can hold fast to Jesus. We can come before Him if we choose to. We can desire to know Him. And I'll end off my sermon today with a very personal story that just happened to me recently. You know, recently, we, we, uh, our staff just came back. All of you know, we just came back from our staff retreat in Malaysia. Right? So there was a night, I think it's the second day of the retreat, I was rostered to lead worship uh, for our second session, our evening session. So as usual, together with my colleagues, we, had, we ate our dinner really fast and then we headed to the function room right, a little bit earlier to just run through the set of songs. Now, my wife and my two sons, they came along this retreat, which is a wonderful thing. But there's, there's a slight worry in my, in my head. No, actually, not, not slight. I'm quite worried. Because my wife is heavily pregnant right now with our third, third daughter. And if you know my two sons, right, you will know how energetic both of them are. I will always tell people, both my sons are perpetually on steroids. You know, all day, every day. It's just different dosage. The older one probably has a higher dosage than the younger one. But that night, right, that very night itself, my sons wanted to come and watch me in my band practice. So they ran into the function room and they came to the stage, the front of the stage, right? And they start to fiddle with the speakers, almost topple the stands. You know, what is this guitar? You know, they were really interested. So this is the photo that my wife captured. So eventually, we just put them, set them there at the, at the step. Or I think they just set them there by themselves. And they started to watch us. <laughs> you know, who are this uncle? Who is, what is daddy doing? Uh? You know? And there's this video. It's an 11-second video that I would like to show it to us. All of you kind of know the song, right? Christ is enough. You know, that night, the night after my wife and my sons have slept, both my sons end up sleeping on our bed. So I slept on a spare bed. <laughs> that, that time, that night, I, I couldn't sleep. So I decided to stay up to, I end up preparing, continue in my preparation for today's sermon. It was around 12.30 a.m., I think. I think they, all, all, all three of them have slept. And I decided to just take a break, you know, scroll through my phone. And that's when I, I, I saw this photo and the video. Now, when I saw the video, I felt the Holy Spirit ask me this question. Will Jeremiah and Zechariah know me? Now, I was I just, in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the dark, I was just like, Lord, I pray that they will come to know you. And I started tearing. I didn't share this with my wife. Because I know that as they grow up, they will be bombarded by so many influence of this world that they are going to be living in. And most of it is probably wrong. You know, right now, I know that they are still, both my sons are still a long way in terms of their salvation. You know, ever since the night of the retreat, Right? Sometimes my, my son in, in, in his room, he'll tell me, Daddy, I want to watch you sing. Daddy, I want to watch you perform. You realize nowhere in his sermon did he mention Jesus. Uh, not sermon, nowhere in his remarks <laughs> did he mention Jesus. <laughs> sermon, wow. Not bad. Huh? Ah, maybe one day he will be here. Okay, okay. No, but each time where he asked me this question, my answer to him, whether you ask me in the room or in the car, you know, I'll say, Daddy is not performing. Daddy is worshipping Jesus. Sometimes after my son, he knows this song, You Are Holy. You know, You Are Holy, Holy. My son knows the whole song. 
But after he sings the song, he will say, Daddy, clap for me! Daddy, clap for me! All the time, I don't need to clap for you. We clap for Jesus, not you. you know? I don't need you to watch me sing because you can sing as well. You can worship Jesus too. He probably don't understand a single word I've said. But every night before they sleep, when I tuck them to bed, I will say the same prayer over them. And I've been saying this prayer over them every single night. That God, that they will know you. God, I pray that they will know you, Jesus. That they will one day serve you. They will love you. They will obey you. You know, this morning, this morning, I, I share this story with us because this morning I sense God. I sense God's one thing, us, asking us a similar question. Some of us, do you want to know me? Do you want to know me? Not just know about Him, but to really know Him. Because when we know Him, the things of this world will become dimmer and dimmer. Right? The things of this world will grow strangely dim. The desires for fleshly things, the desires for things that our eyes set upon, our prideful nature, it will gradually grow dimmer and dimmer. If I don't have what you have, it is okay. I celebrate you. I cheer you on. Can I ask us to close our eyes and bow our heads for a while? Can I invite the worship team to come on stage? You know, I, I did not know this when Pastor Eunice planned the set this morning. There's a song. It's called Knowing You, right? I actually texted her without, re without reading her email to me. I said, I, I really felt that I want this as a, as a closing song. This song is called Knowing You. And Pastor Eunice said, do you know that it's in my set? I said, I don't know. I don't really believe in coincidence. I believe everything is orchestrated by God. And even as, as the worship team leads us again in this song, I just have a request for us that we not sing. Let's not sing first, but let the lyrics speak to us. Because those words are not easy words, you know. If you really read those words, you know, where you don't really care about any, the things of the world anymore, you just want to know Jesus. And even as they sing, would you let the words, let the Holy Spirit through this song speak to you? With all eyes closed and all heads bowed, let's just spend some time in a time of reflection. Thank you, Lord. someone here you love God you really do but there are some things in your life that you just can't let go of some things in your life that you can't hold with an open palm I don't know what are those things it's okay but God knows if that is you I really want to pray for you no, no one is looking if that is you would you put up your hands 
and let, and, and let me pray for you. If you are struggling, thank you very much. You can put down your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, you see the hands they are raised this morning. Father, I lift up my brothers and sisters. In fact, God, I lift up all of us into your hands. Lord, all of us love you, Lord. But there are times, there are times, God, we will say that we love the things of the world a little bit more. But Father, today we are not going to feel condemned because that's not from you. But God, we are coming into your presence now. That God, in your presence, God, we, we repent before you. In your presence, we ask for a new heart. Lord, we ask, God, that you rekindle that passion. Lord, I ask, Lord, that for a rekindling of that passion and deeper intimacy and love for you, that, God, when we open our Bibles, God, something was changed. We, we, we don't know what it is, God. Something divinely will change. We will fall in love with your word all over again. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, including myself this morning, God, that, Lord, you help us that God, we will love you more than we love this world. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we lift, I lift my brothers and sisters up to you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me even as we sing this song one more time as a worship to the Lord? Come. Thank you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you. To be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn or surpassing. we thank you Lord we thank you Lord Lord we thank you for this morning Lord we thank you for your word we thank you Lord for your work Holy Spirit that you are speaking to each of us Lord help us to live here help us to not just forget what we have heard but Lord we live here live this place God and, and, and let us take actionable steps God to draw deeper to to you to know you deeper and God we just want to lift up all of us into your hands and right now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and our loved ones now and always Amen Amen